Because when that voice comes and speaks to those seeds of faith, it snaps him like a twig. David said it breaks him even as the cedars of Lebanon. So let's quickly review before I go on. The first thing is this, that when the voice of the Lord comes, it's a spiritual experience. Something takes place inside of us when we hear the voice of God. Yeah. When the voice of the Lord comes and we hear it, we have strength to press through, sustain, and stand firm against all of the wickedness that might come against us. And the next one, verse 5, is that when the voice of the Lord comes, it speaks to and it breaks Bondages that we might find ourselves locked into. Hallelujah. Ooh, this next one may be even maybe my favorite one of all. This is so cool. Verse 6. You see, he makes, that's the voice of the Lord. He makes them also to skip like a calf. Lebanon and Saran like a young unicorn. He maketh them to skip even as a calf. To skip. So David is thinking and he sees as a metaphor the young lamb. The, he sees the young unicorn, so to speak. He sees the young animal. He sees the young deer after it's been born. And it's full of energy and it's full of life. And they just bound and they skip and they bow their backs, and they have this, folks, they have this, they have no cares of life. Amen. They have, they are completely set free of cares, no cares, Amen. and they just skip, and they bound, and they're so free, and David watches that, and he says to himself, when I hear the voice of the Lord, and it gives me strength, it helps me to sustain, it breaks all my bondages, it sets me free of all my cares. It sets me free. So I don't have to worry about the wicked anymore. I don't have to worry about my enemies anymore. My enemies. I just can be free in the things of God. And I skip even as the calf. Folks, I'm here to tell you something. That you talk about a spiritual experience is to be liberated. Mm -hmm. To be liberated is an incredible spiritual experience experience. You see, folks, people turn to drugs to find liberation. People turn to perversion to find liberation. People turn to immorality to discover and try to achieve liberation. People turn to crime to find liberation. People turn to rebellion to find liberation. The other day, we were at a party and this young lady she, she actually grew up in our church in Spokane. She, she, she was just about this big, about this big for a few years while we were there when she was born before we left. So she probably was a young girl for three, four years maybe under our ministry. Parents extremely involved in the church. <clears throat> but the parents were not good examples of the mighty. We're not good examples. And this young gal, I don't have time to tell the whole story, but this young gal, to find her liberation, she turned to rebellion. So anything that mom or dad was for, she's against. Anything that mom stands for, she's against. Anything that mom watches on TV, she doesn't watch it. Anything that mom says is yay, she says nay. Anything that mom says is nay, she says is yay. And as you watch her live her life, you see that this whole, this whole time is her trying to find liberation through rebellion of her parents. I went out and spent a little bit of time with her. She was doing some, some work on a vehicle. And I went out and I talked to her and I said, you know, can't your dad or your, one of your brothers do this for you? And she said, no, I can do it myself. She lived with a boyfriend for several years and then she made this comment. She said, you know, it's intimidating to men when they know that I don't need them. And I thought that's so sad. It's fine to be a liberated female. 
But sweetie, your whole liberation is based upon rebellion of what you see and saw that you don't want anything to do with. You see, folks, here in verse 6, David said, He maketh them also to skip carefree. Carefree. Folks, I cannot tell you what it means to be absolutely carefree. It doesn't matter anymore. The stresses, the anxieties, the pressures of life, whatever it might be, when the voice of God speaks to the seeds of faith that are in my soul, and I read this verse, and I read this scripture, and instantly God comes and He sets my soul, He sets my spirit to care for me. Hallelujah. And folks, you can't get that any other place than in a secret place. You have to have a secret place to get that. You're not going to get that by wandering out there. You're not going to get that by being so busy and occupied with the cares of life and you just can't wait. We, my wife and I, we have conversations on the phone, on the phone, people that we knew years ago. And it's just so sad. It's just so sad. And basically the voice is, yeah, we're just waiting on God. Waiting on God to come and do the work that he that we want him and that he, he wants to do. Don't know, we're just trying to sustain. We're just, just trying, we're just waiting on God. And there's just no hope. There's no hope, there's no strength, there's no faith, there's no fellowship, there's no being set free of cares. Yeah, we're just trying, we're just trying to get through, just trying to survive. And I just feel so bad. I just feel so bad. And one of the main reasons, folks, is they talk like that is because they don't have a church and a preacher like ours who will preach this word of deliverance, who will preach this word of being set free, who will preach this word of having cares being set free by hearing the voice of God and fellowshipping and planting seeds of faith you see, they have seeds of faith. They know what the Bible says, but they don't hear the voice of God. They say that. They tell us that. We don't hear the voice of God. Therefore, any seeds of faith that might be in there are dormant. They're dormant seeds of faith. Next one, verse 7. The voice of the Lord divided the flames of fire. This means, this is what this, that means. It means this. It means the voice of the Lord purifies. Purifies. You see, Peter's going to talk about it in his writing. He's going to say the trial of our test, the test, or the, the trial of our faith purifies our faith which makes it worth even more than gold and silver. You see, the voice of the Lord purifies. It cleanses, it purifies. Now folks, understand this. You see, just because one is sincere, we, we saw that if you watch the news the last month or so, there's a, this movement in our society today that, well, if, if they're sincere, then they must be telling the truth. Well, those are just stupid people who talk like that, who have never worked with criminals or first graders. <laughs> it's exactly what that means, you see. Just because we're very sincere doesn't mean that we're telling the truth. Yeah, I've watched criminals, grown men, literally cry. They're about to be arrested in the office. The cops are in there, they're going to cuff them and stuff them. And these growing, strong, powerful young men begin to cry. And I didn't really do it. Even though we have a P-test that said he's just loaded with this stuff, right? I didn't do it. I didn't do it. And then my, you're going to take my children from me. And then what about my life? And I didn't do it. And they're sincere in claiming the fact that they didn't do it. 
Sincerity doesn't mean that they're telling the truth. You see, all first graders are very sincere. Johnny, I saw you throw that stick at Billy. Now, you know there's no throwing sticks on the playground anymore. If you do that again, I'm going to have to write you up. I didn't do it. Yes, you did. I sat right here and watched you pick up the stick and throw it at Billy. I didn't do that. That was Jimmy that did that. I was playing baseball. No, you didn't. I saw you throw the stick. No, I didn't. You know, you're just lying, Mr. Stavros. Why do you always lie? You see, you know, you know that someone's lying when they call you the liar. And that's every first grader. Every first grader cannot tell the truth. They are all little liars. It's just the way it is. You see, the voice of the Lord divideth the flames of fire. In other words, it purifies. Folks, let me tell you something. What really is needful in the church and the body of Christ today, our Christianity and our faith needs some purification. Yes, yes. It really does. Our country needs some purification. We need to be purified. You know, if you drink bottled water long enough, we've been drinking bottled water now for, for a long, long, long time. When, when I had to start drinking at least 60, 70 ounces of water a day, that, you know, I don't drink water out of the tap anymore. And, and now I can barely even stand to smell the water that comes out of a tap because I've been drinking purified water for over three years. Honest, honest, it's true. Okay? I can't drink tap water anymore, as clean as it is, because I'm used now to purified water. I can't go back. When you've been purified by the voice of God, folks, you don't want to go back. Can you say amen? amen. Verse 8. The voice of the Lord shakes, shaketh the wilderness. The Lord shaketh the wilderness of Kadesh. What that means is this. When the voice of the Lord comes, it awakens. It awakens. What does the scripture tell us? Paul said, awaken out of sleep. Awaken out of sleep. The church needs to be awakened. Let me tell you what happened these last few weeks. We watched as, as a charade took place. And this side of the aisle politically attacked one who was being appointed to the Supreme Court. Let me tell you a benefit that happened as a result of those three weeks of incredible wickedness. It awakened a lot of people. You see, sometimes we think that this is just terrible and shouldn't be. Well, he shouldn't be talking like that. They shouldn't be doing that. He shouldn't go there. They shouldn't be there. And on appearance, in the present moment, in a snapshot, it may look the worst thing. But when we're sustained in the things of God, and when God has His way, it always works out to the very best. And folks, we were shaken. We need to be shaken. Can you say amen? I don't know what tomorrow holds, but I know who holds tomorrow, and I'm in the palm of His hand. Can you say amen? amen. Yes. Hallelujah. You see, the voice of the Lord, it awakens and then verse 9, the voice of the Lord maketh the hinds to calf, and discovereth the forest, and in his temple doth everyone speak of his glory. This is what that means. When he says, maketh the hinds to calf, that means new birth. When the voice of the Lord comes, it brings with it a new birth. And when that new birth takes place, it is an experience that I want to share with somebody else. It is an excitement that I want to be a witness to to somebody else. The voice of the Lord has come in me and birthed in me something new. Folks, in preparation for this message this morning, all day and laying in bed at night, I just prayed, oh God, oh God, birth a new birth in me. Birth a new birth. Set me free, oh God. Set me free of my cares. And I want to close with this. I want to close with this. And being transparent to us here this morning. Because you see, it's like I said. Sometimes we think the worst thing for us or something that we absolutely abhor or dislike and that we think is unfair may be the very thing that is needed of us. Well, the other day I had a doctor's appointment with my, my kidney doctor. 
And I'm really getting to not like her. <laughs> because she has no empathy. And I've got to tell you something, folks. Sometimes what I need from her is not empathy. And I come away mad. I'm getting another doctor. I'm sick of doctor. She doesn't care. There's no empathy. She can't relate. I'm just tired of her. Well, the other day, and it seems like whenever I go to see her, I've always had kind of a couple bad days. Where, you know, you go to the doctor. You want to go to the doctor sick so they can help you out, right? If you go to the doctor and now you're not sick, you're feeling a lot better, it's hard to try to convince them that you're really sick. Oh, God, well, I'm just really... You know, I'm damn, I know I'm acting right now because I really actually feel a lot better. But could you please give me the happy pills because I really am upset. <laughs> so I go to the doctor and, you know, and, and I kind of want her to know that you know, maybe I'm kind of sick. So I'm explaining things to her. She's listening to me like we all do when we go to the doctor. And then she says this to me. She says, well, Daryl, it just appears to me that you're depressed. So I'm not depressed. Oh, I think you are. I think, you're, I think you need a psychiatrist. I don't need a psychiatrist. Would you like some pills? No, I don't want any pills. And then she goes, well, why? I said, because I know what they do to you. I said, I'm not depressed. I said, I, I, I'm, not, I'm, not, and I'm not going to take any of those pills. And she just finishes all up. And she closes her computer and she goes, well, okay, if, you, if you'd like to have some, some medication for your depression and like to see a counselor, you just let me know and I'll get you what you want. And I come out of there about as mad as I can be, right? And as I'm driving home, as I'm kind of praying, meditating upon the Lord, I got to thinking, you know what? I went into that office just loaded with the cares of life. It's no wonder that she thinks I need more medication. <laughs> I said, oh, Lord, and then the Holy Spirit convicted me and said to me, you're supposed to be an expert in God. And if you're an expert in God, these things don't fit. And folks, I hate my doctor even more. You know why? Because she awakened me. She shook me like I'm trying to do to you this morning. Awake you, shake you, <coughs> set you free of all your life's cares. Amen. And I got to tell you, since I saw the doc a few days ago, my days have been awesome. Amen. My days have been awesome because I'm an expert in God. And when I hear the voice of God, I'm all of these things. Can you say amen? Yes. Hallelujah. Honey, if you come, please, we're now going to partake of communion.